you advance. Sorry, just okay. So I'm hoping everyone has the slides. You should see the slide at the top. It says side effects. Uh, and I am now going to begin the presentation. Patients that receive second-line anti-TB therapy for drug-resistant TB will present with a wide variety of side effects. The majority of these side effects are not severe, and they can be managed without the discontinuation of therapy. However, some of these are life-threatening if not recognized and treated promptly. And if the side effects are not well managed, there's a higher risk of default and treatment failure. And it's also very uncomfortable for the patients, many of whom have already received two or three treatments for tuberculosis before starting MDR-TB therapy. Here's a list of some of the very common side effects for drug-resistant TB treatments. I'll let you look at those quickly rather than reading off this entire list. We're going to go through each one of these separately. Before, uh, the, the way I'm going to plan this talk is I'm going to give you a brief description of each one of these side effects. And then I will give you an overview of some studies that have presented on side effects. And then I'll go into much more detail about one cohort in Russia. So just to, so we're all on the same page at the beginning, I want to briefly describe what we mean by each one of these uh, side effects. So ototoxicity can present with mild tinnitus, severe tinnitus, hearing loss or deafness, or disequilibrium. Uh, this is a major, major toxicity, particularly with any of the injectable drugs. It's very common, and it is one of the most upsetting side effects for many of the patients. Psychiatric side effects, um, cycloserine is the big offender here, but in terms of psychiatric side effects, you, you can get irritability, anxiety, personality changes, or extremely severe depression, psychosis, and suicidal ideation. Neurologic side effects, dizziness, headache, insomnia, vertigo, or you can have seizures, syncope, and severe peripheral neuropathy. Endocrine side effects are also quite common. You can have poor glycemic control in diabetics, and hypothyroidism is extremely common with some of these drugs. Dermatologic side effects, skin pigmentation changes, bronzing, particularly with uh, clofazamine. You can have photosensitivity, dry skin, or Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Gastrointestinal side effects are extremely common with these medications. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you can also have gastritis, ulcers, hepatitis, and bowel obstruction. Nausea vomiting is a very key factor to pay attention to because up to three quarters of patients can have it. Electrolyte abnormalities are another major problem, particularly with the use of capriomycin. So you could have, in a minor situation, dehydration, but you must watch for hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Other adverse events include arthritis and arthralgias, which are also quite common, particularly with the use of pyrazinamide, and uh, weight loss, renal insufficiency, particularly with the injectables, and optic neuritis. So quiz one to get everyone involved. Let me read it. What proportion of patients will experience at least one side effect or toxicity from drug-resistant TB treatment? Is it less than 10%, 10 to 19%, 20 to 29%, 30 to 39%, 40 to 49%, or greater than 50%? So for all of you who voted, the right answer is actually greater than 50%. I will 
show you three cohorts and give you a quick update on on uh, the rate of side effects in each one of these cohorts. So this is a great paper. Uh, if you are interested in more detail, it's by Torin, and I put that reference down there at the bottom. It's in the International Journal of TB and Lung Disease, at Torin, T-O-R-U-N. Um, T is the first initial. So this is a cohort of patients from Turkey. 263 HIV negative patients who started MDR-TB treatment from 1992 to 2004. And 69% of patients experienced at least one side effect. And in the paper, in the manuscript, they clearly delineate exactly how they defined each one of these side effects. The most common was ototoxicity in 42%, psychiatric disorders in 21%, gastrointestinal disturbances in 14%, um, you also had arthralgia, seizures, hepatitis, and dermatologic effects. Now that rate of gastrointestinal disturbances is lower than you will see in other cohorts. So keep in mind, it depends on how this is defined. And they had a more stringent uh, definition for this than some of the other cohorts. At least one drug was withdrawn from the treatment regimen due to side effects or toxicity in 56% of patients. Uh, here's another cohort from Latvia. This is 1,027 cases. They started MDR-TB treatment between 2000 and 2004. 79% of patients experienced at least one side effect, with a median of three side effects per patient. The most common, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. The most serious were their psychiatric episodes, hepatitis, and renal insufficiency and at least one drug was temporarily or permanently stopped in 64% of patients. Now this cohort I'm going to go through in more detail. It's the third cohort and it's the cohort from Tomsk. And I think it is helpful to actually really drill down for each one of these side effects in one cohort. This is a Partners in Health cohort from Russia. It was a case series of 244 patients that were treated in Tomsk from 2000 to 2002. 28% of patients had baseline comorbid conditions and they had a median number of six drugs. These regimens included an injectable agent, quinolone, PASS, ethionamide or prothionamide, and cycloserine. The median time in treatment was 18.5 months, and the median duration of the injectable drug, which is very key, was 8.6 months. 73% uh, of patients in this cohort experienced at least one side effect. 29% required discontinu discontinuation of a drug due to a side effect. But keep in mind, every effort was made to, to avoid stopping drugs. So if you're treating MDR-TB patients, even if you do your best to manage their side effects, you still may have to change some drugs. Um, they managed most side effects symptomatically. And I'm now going to give you a more detailed description of the drug regimens, the side effects, and the management for each one of these uh, before starting MDR-TB treatment in this cohort, they did a battery of baseline laboratory tests, including a complete blood count, electrolytes, liver function tests, BUN, creatinine, HIV testing, audiometry, psychiatric evaluations, and pregnancy testing. So these were not prevalent conditions. These side effects and toxicities that I'm going to explain to you are new conditions on drug-resistant TB treatment. The monitoring in this cohort was, was pretty stringent. They had a chest x-ray at initiation and then every six months. And they had liver function tests, creatinine and potassium at initiation and then monthly. And if the creatinine increased, then they adjusted the dose of the injectable. But keep in mind, the WHO guidelines would say to do, would, well, they would say to do this every month for creatinine and potassium, but they would not for liver function tests. Liver function tests, WHO guidelines recommend monthly for only the first three months. And this, this cohort, they also followed a TSH every two months. Here is a list of the medications, which is always really important when you're interpreting um, side effects because they're so related to specific drugs. You'll see that all of these patients, if you add up the K 
canamycin and the capyromycin, that's the KM and the CM in the red, you'll see that they all had uh, an injectable. Usually it was, they used capyromycin more commonly than canamycin. 99% of patients on the green line you'll see had a quinolone that would have been ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, or levofloxacin. You'll note they had a 500 milligram dose of levofloxacin, whereas now the WHO recommends a gram if you're over 50 kilos and 750 milligrams if you're under. Uh, so we're using, a, we're now in clinical practice using a slightly higher dose of levofloxacin. Um, nearly all patients received cycloserine. Three quarters of them received ethionamide, and 89% received PASS. Now the WHO guidelines recommend an injectable, a quinolone, ethionamide, and either cycloserine, or an either, yes, either cycloserine or PASS. So in following the WHO guidelines now, we may have, for example, a slightly lower rate of hypothyroidism if you're using less PASS and ethio in combination. Quiz two, what MDR-TB drug is most likely to cause ototoxicity? Wonderful job, everyone. Canamycin was the most likely drug to cause ototoxicity. I'm switching now to using this same format for each one of the side effects. Uh, these slides come from the, the paper Adverse Reactions Among Patients Being Treated for TB in Tomsk, Russia, and Sonia Shin, S-H-I-N, is the first author. It was published in the International Journal of TB and Lung Disease in 2007. So if you have any more questions on this, that is a wonderful paper and a great resource. So out of this cohort, which was 244 patients, uh, 38 patients developed moderate to severe hearing loss. The suspected medications are always the injectables, streptomycin, canamycin, amikacin, and capriomycin. And if you're treating MDR-TB patients, this is going to be a daily event for you, having patients begin to develop tinnitus, begin to develop worsening hearing loss, looking at their clinical situation and trying to make a decision about what to do about the injectable. The injectable is a very key drug, so you'd very much like to not lose this drug, and um, this is a cause of a lot of angst for drug-resistant TB providers. The median time to this adverse event was 6.6 .6 months of treatment. So again, at this point, you're beginning to get to the place where you say, well, the patient's been culture negative for four months. What should I do about this? Well, what you have to do is you really try and continue the injectable, if possible, uh, for usually around six months after culture negativity. Um, every guideline is a little bit different. Management strategies, you can, if you, the patient is taking canamycin, it may help to switch it to capriomycin. There's no randomized control trial data on this. Uh, some experts feel that capriomycin um, may be less likely to do this than canamycin. Uh, the hearing loss is usually irreversible, but if you stop the drug, progression is usually halted. And sometimes you do have to either suspect, suspend the injectable or have it on every other day. And this is a good time, you know, in these patients to ask an expert if you can and talk about the patient's drug susceptibility patterns, what other alternatives you have, what does their chest x-ray look like, what is their clinical situation. But this is an extremely important side effect and it's a very difficult management strategy when patients develop severe ototoxicity. Quiz three. What MDR-TB drug is most likely to cause psychosis, seizures, and depression? I gave you a hint about this when I had the psychosis slide up.
So cycloserine, otherwise called psychoserine, is a major offender in psychosis, seizures, and depression. So in this TOMS cohort, 29% of patients, which is 12%, um, developed psychosis. And whenever a patient develops psychosis, cycloserine is always number one, two, three, four, and five on your list. And in fact, you really should screen patients before you start them on drug-resistant TB therapy for any history of psychiatric disease whatsoever because of the risk with cycloserine. The median time to the adverse event is 3.3 months. And what can you do? You've got to keep antipsychotics on your formulary, absolutely. Um, Haldol is what we tend to use in Haiti. You can lower the dose of cycloserine or stop it for short periods. You can, if you have any other medications they could be on that could be contributing, you could stop that. Um, the psychosis can be quite severe, so you'll need to have a strategy for what you're going to do if a patient becomes combative and uncontrollable. Uh, depression also caused by cycloserine. Eight percent of patients developed depression, and this was quite severe. Uh, in addition, uh, patients with MDRTB have very difficult social situations. Um, they may be, if you're hospitalizing them, they'll be away from their families, which makes things much more difficult. In Haiti post-earthquake, we've had a much higher rate of depression on our MDRTB therapy because we have to keep patients in the field hospital away from their families. The median time to this event is 7.3 months of treatment, but it can occur quite early in therapy. What to do about it? Address their psychosocial and their socioeconomic stressors as much as possible. If the more you can do things like incorporate job training into MDRTB therapy, make sure their family members have school fees, uh, be very aware of the impact of having a patient on drug-resistant TB therapy and potentially not working, be aware of that impact on their family. Group therapy, antidepressant medications. Um, if you get fluoxetine through the International Dispensary Association, it's a penny a pill. So really, antidepressant medications are used not as much as we could, and they're really quite inexpensive. You could also lower the dose or temporarily or maybe even permanently suspend cycloserine. Seizures. Seizures are also related to cycloserine. So before starting patients on therapy, it's very important that you ask them if they have a risk for seizures. And it's very important to be sure they are controlled on an anti-seizure medication. The median time to seizures is 5.4 months. You can look for other causes. Be very aware if they're on um, capramycin in particular. Could they have electrolyte abnormalities? Um, seizures were reason for a permanent interruption of a medication in 11% of patients in the Thompson cohort. It's not that you can't use cycloserine if the patient needs it as long as the patient is well controlled on anti-seizure medications before you start therapy. Peripheral neuropathy was only occurred in 4% of patients in this cohort. In this cohort, you'll see it in higher proportions in other cohorts. There are many medications that can do this. Isoniazid is really one near the top of the list. Also, ethambutol, ethionamide, quinolones, cycloserine, aminoglycosides, and caprio. The median time to this event was 14 months, so it tends to be later than the other adverse events. And it is occurs at a much higher incidence in patients with diabetes, HIV, or alcoholism. So it's something to just be aware of. What can you do about it? Um, tricyclic antidepressants, which also can be obtained quite cheaply, physical therapy, and just be very aware of other causes. In addition, be sure that you have all patients on pyridoxine that are on MDRTB therapy. Rash occurred in 16% of this cohort. That's higher than some other cohorts, but really, and really any medication can do this. Pyrazinamide and ethionamide are two potentials, but again, any drug can do it. Median time was 4.7 months of treatment. It's usually transient, but you have to be very aware of a potentially severe drug reaction. In this cohort, rash resulted in a permanent interruption in 8% of patients. Quiz number four. I gave you a hint on this one earlier as well. What side effect is most likely to occur from the combination of ethionamide and PASS? That's hypothyroid. That's that right. Yeah.
Um, so the correct answer is hypothyroidism. Uh, this is another very common side effect. Uh, we define hypothyroidism as a TSH greater than 10. Now, you may not notice this unless you look for it, and it is reversible. Uh, but uh, K.J. Sung and colleagues, ju colleagues just published a paper in the International Journal of TB and Lung Disease where they found almost two-thirds of patients had hypothyroidism, and that was a cohort from Lesotho. So this cohort had 17%, but if you look for this, you will find it in a lot of patients. If you don't do the TSH, then not that many patients actually present with symptoms that are obvious, or it may be hard to interpret. You know, if they're feeling fatigue, it may be difficult to know that that's from hypothyroidism and not from the TB itself. The suspected medications are ethionamide and PASS, particularly if you use them in combination. The median time to, to developing a TSH greater than 10 is six months of treatment. What can you do about it? Well, for the patients, this can be very uncomfortable. So by monitoring and starting Synthroid, you can usually, or levothyroxine, you can usually lose, use rather low doses, 25 to 75 mics a day. I'm loath to recommend this, but you may have to substitute another medication. There's just not that many options, and these are, you know, your group four drugs. So, really, if you're giving, if you're adding levothyroxine, hopefully you won't have to discontinue the FEO or the PASS very often. Uh, and just keep in mind, it's reversible. After four to five weeks after treatment completion, they will normalize their thyroid. Nausea and vomiting. In this cohort, they reported it in 75% of patients, but if you look at the fine print, that was any occurrence of nausea or vomiting documented by a physician. Suspected medication is really almost any of them. As you see on there, I'm not going to read you the whole list pass. Well, you've got like almost every drug can do this. The median time to the adverse event is 1.8 months of treatment. This occurs very, very early in therapy. It's very uncomfortable for patients. What can you do about that? Give them antiemetics, antacids, hydration, monitor their electrolytes, and just encourage them to keep taking their drugs. This is one of the key reasons that directly observed therapy is so important to really encourage the patients to keep taking the drugs even though it makes them feel sick. Um, diarrhea occurred in 46% of patients. Again, there's a very wide range of drugs that can do this, and you can see it on the red line, the suspected medication list. Um, the median time, again, quite early, 2.3 months of treatment. The diarrhea tends to be a little better tolerated than nausea vomiting, but patients still find this extremely uncomfortable. So uh, another reason to really encourage them to keep taking their drugs and supportive management with hydration and antidiarrheals and also to monitor their electrolytes, particularly if they're on capramycin. Hepatotoxicity. In this cohort, hepatotoxicity was reported in 17% of patients, but keep in mind that more than a third of these patients were drinking alcohol while on drug-resistant TB therapy. So ideally, they would be not drinking alcohol, and that, that is probably the reason that they had a higher than usual rate of hepatotoxicity. What are the suspected medications? Pyrazinamide. Now that the WHO guidelines recommend that everybody receive pyrazinamide, um, you will be, you really need to watch for he um, hepatotoxicity from that. Isoniazid, ethambutol, ethionamide, and PASS can also do it. The median time to hepatitis is 5.8 months of treatment. Again, keep in mind the WHO guidelines are saying monthly LFTs for the first three months. So if that's what you're doing, you, you really have to be aware of watching for symptoms of hepatitis or else monitor the patients more frequently. What can you do? You can decrease the dose of pyrazinamide and watch for any other hepatotoxic agent to make sure the patients are not drinking alcohol. Hypokalemia is very key, very, very key to watch for. 33% uh, of patients in this cohort developed it. They were using a rather high rate of capriomycin. Canamycin is often the first-line drug, and canamycin is probably less likely to cause electrolyte abnormalities. But any one of the injectors can do it. The median time to event is about 4.8 months of treatment. You have to monitor for hypokalemia and replete both potassium and magnesium. 
Um, you can tem temporarily suspend the injectable, but again, injectables are very key drugs for an MDR regimen. So really try and aggressively monitor for this, aggressively repeat their electrolytes so you can keep them on the therapy. But this can be very, very serious, and you may have to stop the injectable agent. Uh, nephrotoxicity, this is why we manage that we will monitor the creatinine every month while patients are on therapy. For patients that have HIV or diabetes or other risk factors for renal disease, it's it may be better to check the creatinine every two weeks. That's what we do in Haiti. Uh, the creatinine can go up very quickly. Again, it's any one of the injectables that can do this. The median time is 4.8 months of treatment. What can you do about it? Watch carefully about giving any other nephrotoxic agents, in particular things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, Bactrim for HIV patients. So you've got to keep a close eye on the use of any other nephrotoxic agents. You can reduce the dose of your injectable, and then you'll definitely have to renally dose if the patients um, do develop renal insufficiency, and you may need to suspend the injectable, because this can be a life-ending event if the patient develops severe um, renal insufficiency, particularly if, there's, if you're in a situation without dialysis being available. Arthralgia. Uh, arthralgia occurred in 47% of patients. It's quite common, particularly with pyrazinamide. In fact, when you start the patient on therapy, now that we're adding pyrazinamide for most patients, it's very worthwhile to ask them if they had arthritis with their first rounds of TB medication. Um, it is usually transient. You can usually control it with non-steroidals, but be careful with the renal insufficiency and in the use of non-steroidals, particularly if patients are not well hydrated if they're having nausea, vomiting. So just be very careful with polypharmacy. You can do physical therapy. You can decrease the dose of pyrazinamide, particularly in patients that are resistant to pyrazinamide on drug susceptibility testing. So we've now gone through our list of side effects. I have only a few more slides here. What I wanted to just give you is a quick overview of what we just talked about. You can see in this TOMS cohort, nausea vomiting was very common, arthralgia very common. Again, those are things ideally that you'd be able to treat through without stopping a drug. All of those nausea, vomiting, arthralgia, diarrhea, ideally you would not have to suspend a drug for those but could manage them symptomatically. Hypokalemia, something you have to watch for and aggressively re replete electrolytes. Hypothyroidism, remember it's, it's reversible, so you could be giving patients, if you're monitoring the TSH every two months, you could be giving patients uh, levothyroxine and averting any of the uncomfortable feelings associated with being hypothyroid. Hepatotoxicity, be sure the patients are not drinking alcohol and watch patients on pyrazinamide in particular for this. Rash. It's going to be obvious if they experience a rash, watch and think, is this going to be mild and transient, or is this potentially something like a Stevens-Johnson, in which case you'd have to stop all therapy and then re-add the drug sequentially. Ototoxicity, major problem. You're going to have to ask your patients every day, do you have any tinnitus? Do you have any hearing loss? Um, and uh, that's one that is going to be very difficult to manage as patients develop hearing loss and you need them to be the, on the injectable. Uh, psychosis, be very alert to watching for personality changes of potential psychosis before it happens to protect the patient. Potentially, you'll decrease the dose of cycloserine. You might have to stop the cycloserine. You'll treat them with antipsychotics. Seizure, ask about seizure before you start any medications. Be sure the patients are well controlled on anti-seizure medications if you're going to use cycloserine and be very, very, very careful in using cycloserine in those patients. It's not that you can't do it, but be very careful. Nephrotoxicity, this is why it's important to manage, to monitor the creatinine and uh, very aggressively manage this if there's any bump in the creatinine. And also, be careful about, particularly with those high rates of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, be very careful that the patients are staying well hydrated, particularly because you have them on the injectable, which has such a high um, potential to cause nephrotoxicity. Uh, depression. Depression can be extremely severe in these patients, so it's something where you have to be aware of their psychosocial situation, be aware of their family situation, try to get them into group therapy, try to have a social worker uh, looking at all these side effects these patients are enduring. D depression is a very big problem, and uh, it's 
important to have antidepressants on the formulary in your pharmacy. And then neuropathy is something to be aware of because it's quite uncomfortable. And um, be sure you have the patients on high doses of pyridoxine. You can see here side effects by month as we were going through those median time of developing side effects, particularly nausea, vomiting, diarrhea very early. But you can see most side effects occur in the first six months of therapy. But the key is, this is why you're getting your patient in care. This is why you're developing a relationship with your patient. They know they have two years of therapy. It's such a long time ahead. It's very important to tell them that this is when they develop the side effects. You're going to treat through it. You're going to manage their symptoms. Uh, but this is one of the real reasons we focus on directly observed treatment, relationships with the patients, explaining that they can get through this because the side effects hit them so early. Uh, you'll see in this TOMS cohort, the cure rate was 77%. So you can still have very high cure rates even in the, even in the face of, of a high number of side effects. Just a couple last slides here I wanted to point out in patients with HIV and MDRTB, this can be very difficult to manage these two diseases together. Keep in mind that some drug-resistant TB side effects can be exacerbated by antiretroviral therapy. Think about nausea, vomiting, nephrotoxicity, hypokalemia, hepatotoxicity, peripheral neuropathy, and CNS side effects. Just going to give you a quick slide here of some of the overlapping toxicities. So peripheral neuropathy, D4T is a major offender, DDI, but then you've also got your isoniazid, your thambitol, your cyclosterine. So watch for peripheral neuropathy, nausea, vomiting. All antiretroviral drugs can do it, and all TB drugs can do it. So nausea, vomiting are going to be a bigger problem in your HIV patients. Keep that particularly in mind because of they also have a high risk of nephrotoxicity. And if your patient is dehydrated, they will be more susceptible to developing renal insufficiency. Central nervous system toxicity, efavirenz is a, you know, this is, a, this is where you have to think about using efavirenz and cyclosterine together. But efavirenz is such a wonderful first line ART therapy. And cyclosterine is a good, inexpensive MDRTB therapy. I mean, as you know, the best we have in with FDO and the fourth-line drugs. So you, you want to use these drugs in combination, potentially. Just be careful about it. Skin rash, abacavir, nevirapine, efavirenz. Again, you're, any one of these drugs can cause a skin rash. And now, if you're giving them Bactrim, plus antiretroviral therapy, plus your anti-MDRTB drugs, these patients have many reasons, many medication potential causes of a rash. Renal insufficiency, tenofovir is a is a concern, so we recommend not combining tenofovir with the injectable agents because of the great concern of renal insufficiency. And in terms of hepatotoxicity, uh, nevirapine is a big cause of hepatotoxicity. Efavirenz is much less likely to do it. Um, some of your PIs can also do it, your protease inhibitors. And then if you're putting these patients on um, pyrazinamide, isoniazid, ethambutol pass, FEO, just be very careful to monitor for hepatotoxicity. What we do in Haiti is we actually check LFTs every month throughout therapy because of this concern. So the management of side effects in the outpatient setting, as we're moving more and more to outpatient management of MDRTB, just be careful to have protocols and algorithms in place, particularly for community health workers that are giving the patients medications at home. You need protocols for at what point do you refer a patient to a physician versus managing it at home. And that will be very situationally dependent based on the level of um, education of your and experience of your health workers and your nurses and physicians. Um, you can manage these, many of these in an ambulatory setting. In rare cases, you'll need to hospitalize them. The main key is early diagnosis and management of the side effects. Usually, clinical evaluation is sufficient, other than you know monitoring for things like hepatitis, um, hypokalemia, renal failure. But most of these can be managed just clinically. Um, and when you're doing your budgets, it's, it's essential to include the management of all of these side effects in the budget so that it can be provided free of charge for all patients. 
supplementary medications to keep in your pharmacy. There's lists published by the WHO and Partners in Health has some of these with exact details of what drugs you could consider, but you'll want, definitely you'll need something to manage your GI side effects, antiemetics, antacids, H2 blockers, antidiarrheals. Th those are all essential medications to have in your formulary. You'll have to have medications for the psychiatric adverse events, antipsychotics and antidepressants in particular. You must have levothyroxine on your formulary because you will have hypothyroidism. Um, in addition, keep very available anticonvulsants. Uh, just make a protocol for what you're going to do if a patient has a seizure and keep those medications very available. Also try cyclic antidepressants for your neuropathy. And uh, potassium and magnesium supplementation. Also calcium is useful in case of electro electrolyte abnormalities. So in conclusion, side effects are very common. You can manage them successfully. It takes prior planning. It takes um, really developing protocols with the community health workers that are going to be seeing these patients. It takes careful work with the pharmacist, ensuring that you have the medications to manage these adverse events. And uh, it's really helpful in your medical record if you can have uh, a page that prompts the clinicians to sort of circle each one of these side effects. And it allows you to go through and look at the rates of side effects and, and track patients. But again, these you can absolutely manage side effects. I have to give a just last statement about what's going on in Port-au-Prince. There's MDR-TB is being treated in camping tents, isolation camping tents, ever since the earthquake. And even in the hurricane winds and the very hot sun of Haiti, the Haitian clinicians are really able to manage these side effects even in camping tents. So though it is difficult, it can absolutely be done with ex extremely good outcomes. So that is the conclusion of this presentation. And now we will take questions. Methods were used to determine the cause of side effects in these combination regimens. Very good question. As you know, these patients are all on at least six or seven drugs. And um, our data in drug-resistant TB is not perfect. So for the most part, you just notice it's not like you're going to be putting patients on one drug at a time and looking for side effects. You tend to look at what happens in combinations. And then you learn sort of what side effects are associated with which drugs. But it's actually quite difficult to know exactly which drug is causing exactly which side effect. And if you look up Sonia Shin's paper, you will see, I actually have it right here, in table four, you'll see as they sort of were trying to decide which drug was the offending agent, there's multiple drugs on every list. In terms of ethionamide and pass, what to substitute, this is where it gets very challenging because you don't always have these options. So just thinking through the drug-resistant TB regimen, you're going to want at least four effective drugs. You can't count pyrazinamide. You can't count ethambutol. So you're going to start out with your injectable agent, your quinolone, which are the real core drugs. And then you have ethionamide which you really want to try and keep, if at all possible. And then you're choosing cycloserine versus PASS. But keep in mind, this is going to go beyond the level of this talk, but there is cross resistance between ethionamide and isoniazid. So for patients that have ethionamide resistance, your options are really quite limited. And to be moving to something like Augmentin in place of Ethiopass is not ideal. So this is where it gets tricky. And you try to not have to substitute drugs. But you really just kind of go through your groups of drugs. And but group 5 drugs, the Augmentins, the Clarithromycins, the Hydocycinizid, those have much less, uh, they have very little data to guide your, you know, to guide the effectiveness of those drugs. So ideally, you do not. Ideally, you wouldn't be stopping those drugs unless you really had to. Um, when there is more than one drug that causes a particular side effect, how do you decide to modify the regimen? Well, for example, um, oh, that's a good question. Like nausea, vomiting, what do you do? Well, for the most part, the serious side effects you can peg to one drug. So like. 
let's say you're talking about psychosis, you would put that on cycloserine. If it was a nephrotoxicity, you'd put that on your injectable. If it was something like a rash that looked like it was going to be severe, you'd have to stop all the drugs. And then you'd have to sequentially add them based on which drug you thought was the most likely offender, not adding that drug. So start by adding the least likely offender. And so that gets a little bit complicated trying to go through each drug, but the basic principle is Stop all the drugs if it's very serious, and then add the least likely offenders and add them back sequentially. And then watch very closely for the development of the side effect again. Um, levofloxacin does not usually contribute to the hypokalemia. I mean, the drugs are usually very well tolerated. Uh, could it contribute? Um, I can't say it couldn't contribute, but you have to have your levofloxacin. You have to have your levoflox or your moxiflox, so you're not going to have any. You're really not going to stop those drugs. So the the key here would be adding, adding potassium and keeping the quinolone and ideally the injectable, because those two drugs, the injectable and the quinolone, are really the foundation of the regimen. Um, in you, oh, I'm sorry. Please explain how to use tenofovir and injectable aminoglycoside together. I would say do not use tenofovir and an injectable aminoglycoside together. Uh, there's just not enough data to recommend it. Are is anyone doing this anywhere? Potentially they are, but we are very concerned. You know, we we have data from tenofovir, and we know you know we monitor creatinine. Um, among patients with HIV, so the, uh, it would make me very uncomfortable using tenofovir with an aminoglycoside. Instead, you could use something like AZT3TC. Uh, if a patient has had a renal transplant, can we still use canamycin or amikacin for these patients? You know, that is, there's just not going to be much data on that. and. That's amazing. We've never had that come up in our resource poor settings of post-renal transplant. Um, you know, I would say that's, that is just too complicated to be able to answer. It would really depend on the clinical situation, on the, um, the severity of the drug-resistant TB. I just, that would take, I would have a nephrologist and an MDR-TB expert manage that patient if it's a patient that is post-renal transplant to um, come up with what is the best for that particular case. Where can we find more information on drug-drug interactions? You know, that is a great question. Do we have anything from PIH? You know, if you look them up on the internet, there's a lot of information on drug-drug interactions. There's a lot of books on drug-drug interactions. Um, the Hopkins Infectious Disease Guide, which is available, you can download onto um, any sort of a device has a wonderful drug-drug interaction for every drug. But if you look on the internet, you should be able to find there's a lot of potential uh, books and other resources on that. Um, the mechanism of hypokalemia due to MDR-TB treatment is the impact of the drugs on the renal tubule. So uh, it gets a bit complicated, but you're not reabsorbing the potassium, and so therefore you end up with hypokalemia, in, in it, and it is, as I said, quite common. Um, someone says, in the previous line treatment, some drugs were noted to lower, to lower the libido in patients, in the majority of patients as expressed. Anything of the same on these treatment protocols? You know, these patients come in, often they're cachexic, they've had three treatment regimens. I, they have many reasons to have uh, decreased libido. I would not alter a treatment regimen based on that. And it would, again, that would be something that was a very individual case. But what, I mean, we've got such high rates of mortality in these patients. Our goal is really just to have them survive. And I would say if that was a big problem for your patient, it's not, you just have to manage that on a case-by-case -case basis. But again, I mean, most patients with drug-resistant TB are, are still dying worldwide. So I. I would just reinforce to the patient that the goal is to survive the two years of therapy. Um, can you use 
the added toxicities as a board poster in Haiti is awareness of the side effects of um, AIDS and MDR TB drugs. Um, you s certainly can. Uh, as you know, in Haiti, we're only treating about 10% of patients with drug-resistant TB. So our big concern, I don't want to scare the patients away in terms of starting therapy. The goal really is going to be to expand the use of gene expert outside of just Jeskio and Partners in Health and to really be able to diagnose all retreatment cases for MDRTB uh, rather than you know having patients come in after getting three or four regimens for um, patients that are on antiretroviral therapy and MDRTB uh, those patients are going to take we, we 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 spend a huge amount of time with those patients going through the potential side effects Do you have experience in male patients who develop gynecomastia? Since as of the present, we have three male patients on MDRTB treatment who complain of gynecomastia. You know, that is interesting. We have a high rate of gynecomastia also in patients that are taking efavirenz. And what we tend to do is we monitor it symptomatically. We also have a patient, uh, a male patient with gynecomastia, and we're doing a thyroid evaluation for that patient right now. But in terms of gynecomastia, um, monitoring it symptomatically and making sure there's no endocrinologic issue. Uh, is there a racial difference with regards to the side effects, like a difference of side effects among blacks, Hispanics, and whites? You know, there probably is. In fact, I'm sure there is. We don't, we don't have enough data on this. As you'll see, if you look up side effects and drug-resistant TB treatment, you're just getting sort of papers that are retrospectively reporting on this. But I would highly suspect that even in terms of the rates of nephrotoxicity on the injectables, for example, that there would be a component, uh, a, a racial component to this. But we don't have any data on that. Uh, next question, is ototoxicity of deafness still reversible? Not usually. And again, this is troublesome. We had a patient that was a musician and had severe MDRTB. And you know we had to continue his injectable. Luckily, he actually did have a little, it improved somewhat once we stopped the injectable. But for the most part, I would consider ototoxicity something that is quite likely to potentially be irreversible. Um, how many creatinines that MDRTB cannot treat? In terms of creatinine and monitoring for nephrotoxicity, this is going to be something you have to do on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. But the WHO guidelines are recommending monthly creatinine levels, at least. Uh, for anybody that has a risk factor for nephrotoxicity, I would do it every two weeks while they're on the injectable. And if they have any symptom of nephrotoxicity, I would immediately check it. But as you know, uh, early stages of nephrotoxicity you're not going to pick up symptomatically and then you just have to look at the patient and say you know there was a little bump in the creatinine okay let's switch the canamycin to capriomycin let's watch this patient very closely let's stop any other nephrotoxic agent let's check a daily creatinine and then you have to just make a clinical decision about your injectable versus uh, whatever the changes in the creatinine versus how severely ill the patient is Um, I got another question on the available experience on TBHIV co-management, especially tenofovir and second line. We are not using tenofovir with second line agents uh, because you have alternatives such as, you know, AZT, 3TC. So for the most part, I would try and avoid tenofovir. Um, there are a few more questions here, but um, sorry, we're going to have to probably hand this back to Alex. And do you want to just have them email you the question? So if you email me, if you email, keep the questions. I would be happy to answer any further questions you have. Yeah, uh, thank you, Serena. So this brings our sixth webinar uh, to an end, and I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Koenig for a very informative and interesting webinar. And I would also like to thank you all for your participation. I hope you all agree that it was very enjoyable.